media recognition from Bloomberg, Reuters, recycling trade publications, patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the US, AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is John Rubino, author of several books on the economy, including The Money Bubble, his website DollarCollapse.com. He's speaking to us from Port Angeles, Washington. Welcome back to the show, John. Hey, Jim. Good to be back. John, nickel spiked and metal exchange canceled contracts prevent shorts from losing. What does that mean? Well, that is a very big question what that means because uh, basically to to elaborate on the situation, um, metals prices have been spiking all over the place and nickel just had a huge spike and there were a lot of people on the short side of, um, of that in the futures market. Uh, and some of them were on the hook for billions of dollars, which might have bankrupted them, might have caused turmoil in the markets otherwise. And instead of letting the market work itself out, um, the London Metals Exchange just canceled a bunch of contracts and said, no, nah, never mind, you don't have to pay. And Which I think is the same thing as saying that the guys on the long side don't get their profits. I'm not sure about that, but, you, you know, if you cancel contracts, somebody has to lose, right? Um so basically it means the markets are completely unmanageable and the guys who are gambling on them out there um, were in grave danger and now maybe not so much because the exchanges are going to bail them out. So it's, it's a, you know, it's a mess. It's the kind of thing that happens in very extreme situations. So that might be the takeaway from it is this is, this is crazy times now that we're going through. And, um, it's very probably only going to get worse from here for a variety of reasons that we can go into today. But uh, the uh, things like that on the metals exchange, when literally they have to cancel contracts because um, things are getting so wild out there that will bankrupt a bunch of people if they don't cancel the contracts, that's a very big deal. And what one question, though, is will that spread to gold and silver? And uh, that's something I don't have an answer for, but uh, I don't see any reason why not. So uh, we could see something like we saw in zinc and silver here pretty soon, because silver is also an industrial commodity. And if so, it will be a very wild ride. You know, if silver does what zinc did, that means it will go from the 20s to the 70s or 80s. You know, it's, it, it would be uh, a lot of fun to watch, especially in a short time. Now, back in the uh, 2008-09 recession, we had the too big to fail thing. Is the same thing happening here on the nickel market? This tycoon in China who tried to short the market now owes between six and eight billion dollars. Should he just be allowed to fail and let uh, the market, as you say, settle things? Absolutely. That's the way it should work. I mean, the, the um, premise of free markets is that if you're brilliant, you get rich. If you're an idiot, you lose. If you take away the if you're an idiot, you lose part of the equation, then everybody becomes an idiot because they know they can uh, take any risk imaginable, reap the rewards of that risk if it pays off, and then not have to um, um, suffer any downside if it doesn't work. Um, and that focuses people's minds. It causes, them, it causes them to be more cautious than they would be otherwise. And... You know, when you take that away, when you take the, the necessity for caution away, there, there's a term for that. It's called moral hazard. And you get a society that's kind of like ours right now. We are permeated with moral hazard, people taking risks and doing stupid things with money that they, um, they, they otherwise wouldn't do because they assume that the Federal Reserve or the Bank of Canada or the ECB or the Bank of England or the Bank of Japan, that are, are, those guys are all out there waiting to bail them out if, if things go wrong. Uh, and that's why the big banks are as big and um, disturbingly um, speculative as they are. You know, the, we've turned the big banks into essentially gigantic hedge funds. 
because the government bails them out when things go wrong, and that leads them to believe they can take any old risk out there anywhere in the world, and they'll be okay because the government has their back. That's exactly the wrong way for a capitalist system to work. You need massive public failure in order to teach other people how not to behave. When you take that away, nobody knows how to behave. Um, that's what we've got, and this thing on the metals exchanges is just a, a, a medium, small-scale example of that. It's reminding us that we are still in extremely crazy times in which governments and the organizations that are quasi-governmental, like big exchanges, um, will still bail out the biggest risk takers because they've become too dangerous to be allowed to fail. Uh, terrible situation with horrible side effects, and that's where we are, and that's what we're doing. Well, uh, it just reminds me so much back uh, in 2008 09, the airlines and other businesses begged for government bailouts just like they did during COVID because they were losing money. But these were the same airlines that were buying back their own shares at record prices. They did have the cash on hand to put away a rainy day fund. They never did it. Will anybody in government and the people running the stock exchanges someday have the guts to do it? Because we know it's going to be short-term pain, but what you come out of it with is a much healthier economic system. Well, I think we might be too far gone for that now because mm -hmm. big failures would totally blow up the system. So we have to reach a point where the Fed's hands are tied by the marketplace. In other words, if they start to bail people out, then the bond market goes through the, or the bond yield go through the roof, and that restricts the Fed's ability to um, manipulate markets. And then the markets go back to their rational levels of pricing, which will, from here would just be <laughs> breathtakingly destructive, you know? And, and I think that's the only way we get there, because governments will no, never voluntarily allow that kind of thing to happen. So they will bail out everybody in sight in the next crisis, just like they bailed everybody out, in sight out in 2008, 2009, like you said, and just as they did it um, during the pandemic, and just as they'll do it now in response to the Russia-Ukraine war and, and all the prices that are spiking, um, they will intervene in every market anomaly to try to smooth it out until they lose the ability to do it. And it's completely possible that we're getting close to that now with inflation. Inflation just today was reported at, uh, in consumer prices in the U.S. of 7.9%. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that is a number that uh, that should be just striking fear into the hearts of everybody in the financial world. And it isn't quite yet, but I think if it continues, which it looks like it's going to for a while at least, uh, you'll see a psychological shift, shift in the markets in which people go from not believing that inflation is a real thing to believing it's a permanent thing. And they'll start acting accordingly. And then if you think, current markets are crazy wait till you see what happens then well if people believe inflation is permanent and it never is uh does that mean they're going to bail into things that uh, really go up with inflation and real estate would be part of that we've already seen in canada and the u.s real estate prices go up around 20 percent in a year yeah well, you could make the case that real estate has already had its inflationary boom and there's not a lot of upside left but traditionally because it's hard to make new high quality land. As the old saying goes, God's not making any more beachfront property, you know, and, and that's, that's true of, of, of attractive pieces of real estate pretty much everywhere in the world. Uh, so those things tend to be pl places where people flee when their financial assets are looking extremely risky. And this is that kind of time. So it would be easy to believe that in you know the next round of inflation, the next commodity boom, et cetera, et cetera, that um, real estate would still do well. But having said that, it's already done really well. If you look at the chart for most major housing markets, and it went parabolic the last couple of years, it's, it's uh, in a lot of cases up 30 or 40 percent in two years. Um, that's an awful lot for houses, which are, are leveraged assets anyhow. You know, if you put down a uh, 20 percent on a mortgage and then your house goes up by 20%. You didn't actually, you didn't just make 20%. You made that amount of money on the amount of money you put down, which is to say 
you make like a hundred percent return. You know, your money doubles rather than going up just uh, one fifth. It goes up, um, or, or sorry, instead of just going up twenty percent, it it can go up a hundred percent because you didn't put mu- put much money down. Now that makes real estate very dangerous in a lot of cases because the people who have leveraged themselves to the hilt to buy real estate don't have a lot of margin. And if we're wrong about house prices continuing to go up and instead they go down a bit, that just causes this cascade of bankruptcies. That's possible too. Uh, we could easily see inflation spike, which pushes interest rates way up, which causes mortgages to get more expensive, which crashes the housing market. So, uh, Short answer to this is that who knows? You know, this is such a crazy world uh, that it's it's really impossible to predict with any kind of accuracy what the current rate of inflation means for the financial markets. It could be a boom, could be a bust. Um, high, highly unlikely to be just muddling along in the in between, but that could happen too. So there's no real way to know. Only volatility is uh, pretty much guaranteed right now. Is the Russia-Ukraine war just about over? You know, a couple of days ago, I would have said, yeah, you know, they're going to cut a deal at, at some point here shortly where the Ukraine agrees not to become part of NATO. Um, Russia promises not to mess with Ukraine anymore and pulls its soldiers out. And that's that. And the, the whole thing uh, just ends. Uh, but the negotiations and the, the action on the ground are not going quite as expected. So it looks like it might drag out a little further. Although, I, you know, this isn't Vietnam. This isn't something that's going to go on for a decade. This will be over one way or another um, in the not-too-distant future, in part because, well, Russia is obviously a, a much bigger military power and uh, is, is able to win this thing if they really go for it, uh, but also because Russia is suffering in the financial markets. They're, they're being kicked out of uh, bank settlement systems and off-stock exchanges and out of commodity trading systems and and it's costing them they're they're in good enough financial shape to get through this but nobody wants to see their currency crash and a lot of their big stocks drop by 90 percent on foreign exchanges and a lot of their banks be unable to fund things they promised to fund uh this is hurting them so they have an incentive to settle too which means that they'll find a deal somehow in in I don't know. I, I'm hesitant to put a time frame on this, but if it goes more than a few more weeks, it would be a real shock just because nobody is coming out of this in good shape and it's only going to get worse as it goes on. Well, I just look back at Afghanistan. The Russians couldn't beat them in 20 years. The U.S. couldn't beat them in 20 years. What if the Ukrainians decide we don't care if we're down to the last man? Well, this isn't like that, though, because mm-hmm. uh, Ukraine is flatter. Your, your yeah. tanks can drive up to the edge of the city. And in uh, Afghanistan, for instance, everybody just went up in the mountains and and took their um, took the anti-aircraft missiles, the shoulder-launched missiles that we gave them, and um, and just shot down planes. You know, and it, it it made it impossible for Russia to stay there, and then it made it impossible for us to really get much done there either. So um, that would be, Afghanistan is kind of analogous to invading Switzerland or something like that. They all, they have plans to go up in the mountains and shoot down at whoever's in there. Um, Ukraine doesn't have that advantage. So I, I don't think this goes on all that much longer because Russia will just ramp it up until they, uh, until they get what they want, which is... Um, Ukraine that is not going to be part of NATO, which, by the way, makes this war NATO's fault. This is really the U.S. and and its allies um, who have caused this, and people should understand that. Uh, There would be no war in Ukraine if we had not tried to talk Ukraine into becoming part of an anti-Russia military alliance that sits right on Russia's border. So um, it's understandable what Russia is doing, although it's not right in any reasonable sense of that word, but it's certainly understandable that they're going to protect their borders. And they wouldn't be doing this if we hadn't pushed them into it. So this is basically our fault. And hopefully, um, well, not hopefully, but I, th- I think we're going to pay a price for it at some point down the road that's, uh, that's going to be a surprise to a lot of people. How can globalists justify sanctioning countries that are critical parts of multinational supply chains? Uh, for example, Russia, I've heard numbers between 60 and 40% of the world's palladium for catalytic converters comes from there. 
Yeah, this is, uh, if you ever thought the globalists were, were smart, this should finally put, um, put that idea to rest. Because uh, think about this. The, the guys who designed the global financial system thought it would be a good idea to have multinational world-spanning supply chains where everybody does the thing they're best at. That's called comparative advantage in economics. And the, um, the raw materials work their way through to fabricators in other places who then send components to other places that do the assembly and then send the products to where they're going to be bought. Uh, that happens in almost every major kind of product and industry right now. So supply chains are spread out all over the world. And in, in good times, it works beautifully because everybody is doing something they're very good at. And prices are low and inventory is just in time and everybody makes huge fortunes who are in the supply chain and, and, and it all works out. Um, however, the same people who designed this system also thought it would be a good idea to punish countries that don't tow the imperialist line by kicking them out of supply chains and kicking them off bank settlement systems and, and things like that uh, and, uh, without any recognition that the supply chains are long and fragile and you pull one link out of a chain and the chain can break completely um, so that you actually suffer more from these sanctions than the target of your sanctions. And now we've got this going on on a global scale where in the Russia-Ukraine war, for instance, supply chains are breaking down all over the place. And as you said, Russia is a big supplier of important things to the rest of the world, including the chip make, the chip market, and including oil. Ukraine, meanwhile, is a, um, a huge agricultural exporter, apparently. They, they make a big chunk of the world's wheat, among other things. Um, so the guys who designed just in time, global supply chains and the re the regime of um, sanctions on the part of big countries to little countries are also the guys who picked the fight in Ukraine. You know, it's like they have no idea what they built and what the implications of what they built are. So they're just blundering around the world, making stupid mistakes that are threatening to blow up the whole globalist project. Uh, I think. The one good thing that's come out of the last few years is that it's made people very suspicious of the guys in charge of the big systems. And that's as it should be because they are morons, Jim. You know, I can't stress this enough. The guys in charge of most of the big systems in the world right now are um, well-educated but extremely unwise people, which means they behave stupidly while speaking articulately. And it's a terrible combination, and it's it's blowing up on us pretty much everywhere you look. So, in other words, book smarts, but they don't know how it works on the street. <laughs> Zero common sense. And and that's really um, the least of it. A lot of them are malicious, maliciously stupid. So there are some really bad combinations of personality traits out there running the world right now. Well, uh, as I've always said, two jobs you don't need any training for or a certificate or some kind of diploma. Politician and parent. And apparently, some of these people running things, they're politicians and parents at the same time. <laughs> <That's> well, <laughs> well, you know, a lot of them aren't even politicians, so they're yeah. like derivative politicians, where the politicians who are morons... Derivative like politicians, people, I like that. Yeah. You know, like in calculus, where you have the first derivative and second derivative, it's like that, where uh, you, you get more and more rarefied with each iteration. And so you've got politicians who, like you said, have no real qualifications otherwise, other than being able to be glib in front of a group of people, um, picking people for these big bureaucracies with the politicians not understanding the bureaucracies and not knowing how to choose well, and the people they're choosing having, not having the slightest idea um, that they're working with flawed models and implementing policies that are going to make things much, much worse. And you don't have to look any further than the United States Federal Reserve for that to be, you know, eminently um, obvious. Uh, but it's true all, all around the world. The um, CDC, the IMF, the ECB, the Bank of Japan, name the big organization, and they're run by people who you really wouldn't want even babysitting your kids. Um, and let alone running the global financial system. So anyhow, that's, that's how empires end up towards the end, right? Go look at any of the big European empires and look at the people they had in charge in the last 
couple of centuries of their existence. And it's usually people who are um, damaged in some really fundamental way or just stupid. Uh, that's where we are. Derivative politician. I, is that your term? Something you just came up with? Because I love it. Yeah, I just made that up on the spot. I was, I was thinking of uh, calculus. And I'm, I'm not sure anybody would really understand that because derivative sounds like they're they're stealing their ideas from somebody else or something. But what I was thinking of was that it's it's the politician and then the bureaucrat is one step removed um, in a negative way from the politician. So they're even worse. Well, I mean, I always wondered what made Bill Gates, a microbiology expert, the guy didn't even finish university. Well, Bill Gates was a very smart computer guy. You did, yeah. He didn't need college to be no. um, a brilliant computer um, programmer and a brilliant executive. But being a brilliant executive in computers doesn't qualify you to be one of the most important people in global health care, right? But then, of course, Anthony Fauci has a, um, a PhD, and I, I guess he's an MD, but somebody who hasn't treated patients in a long time, but he seems qualified, and look what he did. <laughs> well, I hope I don't get you kicked off YouTube saying that. Can I say that now? Is it late enough in the process? If uh, not, okay. edit it out. Yeah, yeah, everybody's lifting mask and vaccine mandates now, so I think it's pretty safe, I hope. We'll yeah, have more with John Rubino right after this. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com Weekly Recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com Weekly Recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with John Rubino. John, gold briefly returned to its all-time high in U.S. dollars, while silver is still almost 50% away from its all-time high. Why is that? Well, that was a very quiet spike for gold, wasn't it? Normally, when it goes to an all-time high, that's uh, that, that's pretty close to the parabolic top, and everybody's all excited, and nobody had much to say about it this time. Um, and you're right, silver is a little over one half of its previous two peaks in other cycles. So it is interesting, and I think that that goes back to the people not thinking this whole thing is permanent yet. They think inflation is transitory and um, maybe we'll have a recession, maybe uh, commodities will top out and then inflation will be zero from a high base. And, and they have that kind of an idea. So they uh, they aren't cocky yet about um, safe haven assets. Uh, the time will come when they'll the people who own gold and silver will be cocky. The people who don't have it will be terrified that they won't be able to get it. And then you get that buying frenzy, which really benefits silver more than gold. And that day could come pretty easily from here. Where we are right now could morph into a precious metals buying panic very easily. Uh, and silver would probably go up some multiple of what, what gold goes up in percentage terms. So let's say gold goes up by 50%. And silver would go up by 200%. Let's say that that's a, a reasonable thing to expect. And that would mean that uh, the gold to silver ratio drops to it's a normal bottom of 20 to 25 or 30, something like that from where it is now, I guess in the seventies probably. So you'd end up getting um, silver going up much faster than gold in that kind of an instance. And it just hasn't happened yet. <laughs> but with uh, a lot of the things that are happening in other commodities markets like we're talking about nickel and uh, and several others that have just spiked lately here just gone up amazingly for uh, no apparent reason other than supply disruptions around the world you can see that happen to silver it's a small market it's very thinly traded um let there be a shortage of it for instance there's a lot of speculation now about um how much silver goes into a missile and Russia is going to have to replace all its missiles because it's shooting them all at Ukraine cities. Uh, stuff like that, that w weird kind of speculation will we'll take hold in silver and get people excited about it. So I, th I think $50 silver is, is really easy to envision. $100 silver is not that hard to envision in the next couple of years. Could the turmoil on the metals exchange with nickel spread to gold and silver? Yes. Oh, sorry. I answered that yeah. prematurely, but yeah, it yeah. definitely could. Um, so I think that um, 
we'll, we'll see if it does because we don't know how the um, the turmoil is going to play out in the metals exchanges, but uh, there's a lot of shortages out there right now, and that's resulting in wild swings in prices, which is resulting in a lot of turmoil in the futures markets, uh, and there's no reason that silver can't be the next candidate for something like that because it's got all the hallmarks. It's an industrial metal that goes into a lot of things that it you can't yet be replaced in. Uh, it's very thinly traded. There's not that much of it out there. Um, a, a few big players wanting to own a lot of silver could just send the price through the roof, and we don't really have the ability to make a lot more of it. it you know, all the hallmarks of something that could be a speculative mania at some point. So, yeah, I, I think if the metals exchanges continue to be very volatile and uh, very unpredictable uh, and very chaotic, then silver will probably get swept up in it. So, yeah, we, we could see <laughs> a spike in silver from 30 to 50 very easily you in U.S. dollars. And uh, at that point, who knows? You don't know where these things top out because once everybody gets excited, uh, it takes a little while for them to come back to their senses. Is there already a big premium on things like silver coins, stuff that isn't uh, controlled by the central exchange? Well, yeah. If you want to buy silver coins right now, you're already paying a much higher price for it than the spot price. Uh, I just heard in a, a podcast interview um, that the premiums on silver eagle coins in the U.S. are 9 bucks. So the uh, the spot price of silver is what twenty six and change right now, and if you have to pay another nine bucks, that's that's like a thirty percent premium, uh, which means the true price of physical silver is already much higher than the spot price. So if enough people see that and see that there's an arbitrage there where they can take delivery of futures contracts at the spot price, turn around and smelt coins at a 30% premium, then um, then that will take the futures price up to the physical price in no time at all. So we could see something like that. What does all this turmoil mean for the Fed's upcoming rate hike? <clears throat> That's a tough one, isn't it? Because it, it was a done deal that they were going to raise interest rates, possibly by 50 basis points in their next meeting. But now you've got... Um, GDP numbers for the current quarter looking like zero. Um, you've got prices of commodities just spiking, which is very deflationary um, as a second order effect. You know, they um, they go up, and that's inflationary because it makes the prices of things rise. But then people are made poorer by those increasing prices, can't buy as much, and that's deflationary. That makes the economy slow down. Uh, so people may be looking ahead to that, and um, otherwise, who knows? It's just such a crazy time. John, I know it's uh, kind of a, a crazy time, but right now, what are you telling your readers, your listeners? Well, I, I'm telling them basically what I'm telling you right now, which is volatility is the thing that uh, that is most likely in all this. We can't know whether there's going to be a um, an inflationary spiral here, which is it's a completely possible thing that just sends the major currencies through the floor and sends interest rates through the roof. Or there could be a slowdown beginning pretty much right now because of all of these incredibly expensive things that people can't buy anymore that uh, threatens to tip us over into a recession, which we're totally unprepared for. Um, so you can't know <laughs> which one of those is going to play out. Um, but one thing you can know that that will either thing will cause tremendous amounts of volatility, and that's what you should be ready for. Um, that means shifting into real assets to the extent that you can to avoid the inevitable government hyperinflation to get out of whatever is coming. Um, being very careful about financial assets that you own because they're only going to get more volatile, possibly with a lot of volatility to the downside. Have some cash on hand um, and, and then really do the prepping thing if you can because um, there's no real way to predict the um, the end result of all this chaos that we're creating right now. And it might be a world in which you're glad you have a garden and you're very glad you have a gun 
and uh, et cetera, et cetera. You're glad you put that food in the garage. Now, you know, now you need it. Um, so things that, um, that used to be kind of a fringe activity and then became um, something a little bit less fringe should now be mainstream. I just think we should all be looking at self-sufficiency in a world where the big systems are no longer trusted with good reason and are no longer capable of, of really taking care of us. John, thank you so much for chatting with us. Thanks, Jim. My guest has been John Rubino, author of several books on the economy, including The Money Bubble, his website, dollarcollapse.com. If you have any questions for John or any of our other guests, you can send them to info at howstreet.com, and we'll ask that question for you. Our YouTube channel is Talk Digital Network. Find us on Twitter, at How Street. We're also on Facebook. I'm Jim Goddard. Thank you for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com, HowStreet.com radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.